People are familiar with monarch butterflies from growing up. Maybe they remember in their childhood seeing them in fields and gardens. Many more of us close to my age and younger are not seeing them in the numbers they used to. Well, the monarch migration is an unbelievable journey. It's also the only species in the world that scientists know of that's done through multiple generations. The monarch will fly several hundred miles, mate, lay eggs, and pass away. That next generation, the children, will do the same thing. Then the grandchildren will do that, then the grandchildren would do that. And through four generations, it makes its way all the way to the northern point where it finds beautiful summer weather. But the interesting thing is, the monarch that left Mexico isn't the one that makes it to Canada. We don't know exactly what it is, the length of the days, the angle of the sun, but somehow Mother Nature tells them it's time to come home and it tells them to go back to the exact same location where their great, great grandparent spent the winter. Okies for Monarchs is an organization of more than 40 different agencies from universities to government agencies to non-government agencies to groups and conservation individuals. We are doing a lot of different things to try to educate, inspire, and empower Oklahomans to do more for monarchs and all pollinators. So what yeah. are these exactly? Well, take a look at this. See the gold on it? These are monarch chrysalis. And they almost look like jewelry. They really do. They don't even look natural. There are so many things that can happen to a monarch between the stage of egg to a butter, an adult mm -hmm. butterfly. It's really amazing when they reach this stage and when they finally become an adult, you, you yeah. feel like you've beaten the odds. A monarch mother lays 100 to 400 eggs. Scientists believe only 1 to 4% of those will make it to adulthood, to the flying stage. And there's lots of natural predation that happens. In fact, that's part of the circle of life. Caterpillars are food, butterflies are food for many other species. But there are a lot of other pressures on them. The biggest change has been how humans use land through the Great Plains and through what were historically prairie. Natural prairies had lots of flowering, natural native perennial plants, and they had a lot of milkweed. The monarch has to have milkweed to lay its eggs on and for the caterpillar to grow. It is the only host plant. While there are many forms of milkweed, and there are 26 in Oklahoma that are native to our state, what you see is fewer and fewer milkweed opportunities for them to land and lay eggs on on their journey north. Scientists do believe warming temperatures has played a role in some of the struggles that pollinators are having and monarchs in general. Here in the central flyway, it might impact them in that when they're coming south, they are finding more and more plants in bloom that they would not have found before. And if they're finding milkweed and they're finding milkweed in bloom, they might be tempted to stop and to reproduce. But in a different decade, a different period of time, it might have been cold and they might not have found those sources and they might have continued south sooner. The decline of the monarch population has been correlated with the decline of milkweed throughout um, the eastern population's landscape. Many of the areas where we used to have milkweed are now developed, and so while they're developed, there are still, what our research has shown, all of these opportunities to recreate that habitat. So in just a month's time, these will all be up and be ready to rear, but we're a little too early right now. So the federal government actually tapped the Field Museum to ask us to help lead the way in answering the question of what is the role that urban landscapes can play to help support monarchs and pollinators overall. And we said, yes, please, because it's a question that we think a lot about. There is so much turf in our residential areas that could be converted, even a small portion of that collectively adds up to huge gains for wildlife. The average suburban yard uses 10 times the amount of pesticides per acre than farmland. 
So these are not healthy places. They might look green, but not all green is equal. And being able to understand what kind of green we should have for all the different co-benefits for people and for nature and where those big opportunities are were definitely part of what we looked at and so if you own a home if you are in a condo and have a balcony with potted plants if you are in an association with a green roof if you have a community garden all of these things are fair game they will be used and so planting milkweed there and other native plants is definitely the strategy and definitely where we can make the most gains and when you do that, not only are you helping monarchs and a whole suite of other wildlife species, you are actually doing climate adaptation. Some people call it bioswales or rain gardens, but these deep-rooted plants help to capture and store carbon as well as water. In that way, we help to connect the dots between something that people already care about and are interested in. It has so many different co-benefits to it, and one of those is really about climate adaptation. And so it's, it's a really wonderful way to align conservation goals with community concerns and interests. The first and foremost thing you can do for monarchs is Look on your local species list, and if milkweed is native to your community, plant milkweed. Surround that milkweed with some native flowering perennial plants. Everything we do for monarchs is good for all pollinators, whether that's hummingbirds and bats, or moths, or bees, or wasps. Everything we do that benefits a pollinator benefits a monarch and vice versa. It's better for our crops, it's better for our communities, it's better for us as humans. If we keep on a path of destructive behavior for these species, then we're really harming ourselves.